God bless America. Hello, everybody. I am the Talk Radio Protégé. This is the Protégé Program. Thank you for joining me on this frigid Tuesday in my neck of the woods. I hope that it's a little bit warmer where you all are living. But uh, today what I want to talk about is the uh, is this from CNN. Supreme Court lets California gun control laws stand. And I don't know if my uh, long-time viewers, I know long, I say long-time, it's only been a year or ish since I've started putting out videos, uh, don't know if you've noticed, but I am a, uh, how, what should, how should I say, rabid gun, gun advocate. Uh, the, the issue of gun control is something that gets me fired up and I like to talk about. So the title of this video is, Did the Supreme Court Get Weak Knees in the Wake of the Florida Shooting? Because I think that these are some issues that uh, maybe should have been debated before the Supreme Court. One of them, certainly. The other, uh, I don't know, maybe not so much, but I'll, I would like to hear your input on this. So the Supreme Court declined Tuesday to take up two gun-related cases out of California, uh, the court let, uh, let stand a ruling upholding California's law mandating a 10-day waiting period and another imposing fees on firearm transactions to fund background checks. And as CNN notes, the court's order comes at a sensitive time as the country is reeling from the latest school shooting in Parkland, Florida. Now, my opinion on these two issues is as follows. Uh, I've talked about it already, uh, but the uh, the right to wield power is something that I'm becoming more and more a uh, fan of. That the idea that law-abiding citizens have just as much right to be dangerous as criminals do, because as we've seen, you know, time and time again, a school shooting happens, and people talk about taking more guns away from more people rather than giving uh, giving the law-abiding citizens who are victimized by these by these attacks the right to defend themselves. And so when it comes to waiting periods around purchasing guns, my thoughts go straight to the victims. What are the victims going to be uh, what are the victims of violent crime going to What's going to be standing between them and defending themselves? And if they need a firearm to defend themselves, or if, if they even believe they need a firearm to defend themselves, then a 10-day waiting period means I'm vulnerable. As soon as I recognize that I, need, <coughs> that I need additional power in order to defend myself, and I decide that it's going to be a firearm, and I go to purchase a firearm, at least in California then for 10 more days, I'm vulnerable. And not only am I vulnerable, but I realize how vulnerable I am in that situation. I think this could potentially drive some people to illegally purchase firearms. And that's something that obviously I don't want to see people doing. I don't want to see people breaking the law for fear of their own safety. But I think that this is exactly what this 10-day waiting period could do. Now, I've heard stories, and I know this isn't evidence that waiting periods are automatically a bad thing. I'm just telling you it's a story I heard. that, And, and it's a conceivable... Um, it's a conceivable scenario, especially considering the current uh, climate surrounding the relationship between male and, men and women. A woman's in an abusive relationship. She decides she's going to end that relationship, and her boyfriend's, uh, or ex-husband, I suppose, could be the scenario, uh, his reaction frightens the woman, and she decides, okay, I could be in danger for my life, I'm going to go purchase a firearm. Well, unfortunately, this woman lives in California, and she goes to an academy sports and outdoors to buy a firearm, and they say, well, you have to come back in 10 days to buy this firearm. And so she goes home and she tries to live her life as if nothing is that bad. And then while she's waiting for her firearm to, to become available for her to pick up, you know, her estranged lover, in a fit of rage, comes to her place of work or her 
home or you know, a place where she likes to go and relax, and he kills her. You know, she she's vulnerable <coughs> in that situation because somebody wants to kill her. She's not vulnerable because she necessarily, automatically, because she's a woman, she's vulnerable because there's somebody that wants to threaten her life, that wants to kill her. And so she needs to be able to wield power. She needs to be able to wield power at a moment's notice because she doesn't know when a situation's going to turn violent. She doesn't know when this estranged lover might come and try to kill her. So why are we making the the victim... Why are we making the victim take an extra measure to slow down their wielding of power? It's as I said in a recent video. Measures that slow the wielding of power in dis it disproportionately affect the the victims of violent crime in self-defense cases. Because if you're going to slow... If you say, I'm going to indiscriminately slow down everyone from obtaining a gun, well then, when, when does a victim of a crime react to a crime being committed? You know, they don't get to react in advance. The perpetrator of a crime gets to do things in advance of perpetrating the crime. He get the perpetrator of the crime a you know if if the estranged lover of the of the woman in our scenario decides he's going to shoot this girl for breaking his heart he gets to go to the sporting goods store and he gets to buy his firearm and wait his 10 days and then go and shoot her maybe he doesn't get her the first time though but the but after that first time now the woman the victim is going to be vulnerable for 10 additional days while the while the perpetrator of the crime has all this opportunity to carry out his crime. And in all likelihood, he's going to be successful the first time. Because as I've said in previous videos now, the power differential between the assailant and the victim already exists. The assailant already has more p power than the victim by virtue of the fact that the assailant is proactive. But now we're going to give the assailant a zero, base, in essence, a zero-day waiting period. When it comes to the people that are carrying out these crimes, a waiting period is nothing. The, the theory of the waiting period is that, well, we can give these people a more vicious penalty if they carry out a crime. If I don't have a gun, and I go to the store, and I buy a gun, and I have to wait ten days, then they can pin premeditation on me in the in a conviction trial the number of victims hasn't been changed folks a, a waiting period on purchasing a firearm does not save any lives i guarantee you that saves zero lives I, I if i'm going to be really generous i suppose theoretically that if a law enforcement agency knew that mr Green wanted to purchase a firearm to facilitate a school shooting and they needed nine days to accumulate enough evidence to convict Mr. Green of conspiracy to commit murder, then a 10-day waiting period would save lives. But how often is that the case? How much more often is it the case that a person that needs a firearm right now has to wait 10 days, and then while they're waiting for their firearm, they're killed or they're injured by, the vir by virtue of the fact that they've been left defenseless by the laws that are allegedly protecting them. That's my opinion on waiting periods, just in case you were curious. The second case, and this surprised me, uh, the, the individuals and organizations behind these cases, I don't know... Hard, I don't know anything about the Second Amendment Foundation. This is the first time I've heard of this organization. But they're behind the case that wants to remove the 10-day waiting period. On the other hand, the NRA, who I am quite familiar with, uh, by virtue of the fact that I like to read their publication, America's First Freedom, the NRA is challenging a California law that imposes fees on all firearms transactions. I would have thought that the NRA would have been behind the, the suit challenging the waiting periods, but apparently they're not. I actually have less complaint against 
fees levied against firearm transactions. The, uh, the thing that they're claiming they take the fees for doesn't bother me or um, has no bearing on my opinion on fees taken against firearms transactions unless the fees are prohibitively expensive. Now, the lawyers for the challengers of the fees case argued, while constitutionally protected conduct may be subject to generally applicable taxes and fees, it may not be singled out for special monetary extractions designed to profit from, or worse still, discourage the exercise of the constitutional right. And I don't know what the number would be. Uh, when you're purchasing a firearm, you're spending usually in excess of $500. So what kind of fee on a $500 purchase is prohibitive? I'm sure I would know it if I laid eyes on it, but if the government was levying a 10% uh, surcharge fee against the purchase of a firearm, that doesn't seem to me like it would be a prohibitive expense. Maybe it does to you. Maybe it would be a prohibitive expense to a poor person. I would just have to see the numbers that California is charging its its citizens in order to purchase firearms in order to be able to say for myself that yes, these are prohibitively expensive fees. Now, what I really wanted to talk about, what I was really excited to see in this column was Justice Thomas's scathing rebuke of the Supreme Court when he wrote his dissenting opinion in the 10-day uh, the waiting period case. He writes, The right to keep and bear arms is apparently this court's constitutional orphan, and the lower courts seem to have gotten the message. It's been nearly eight years since the court issued an opinion declaring that the Second Amendment is not a second-class right. Refusing to take up the issue... By refusing to take up the issue, justices undermine that decision. As a result, lower courts are failing to protect the Second Amendment to the same extent they protect other constitutional rights. And then we got the imagine-if scenario. And I know that we, especially on the side of liberty in these scenarios, are becoming... Or I, I hear it in pundits. I hear pundits and commentators say, I know it's a cliche, but imagine the situation reversed. And... I want to ask any of uh, any of my viewers here, my regular viewers, if something is a cliche, does that mean it's less less right? If something is a cliche, does that make it invalid? If it's a cliche to say, imagine the court voting to not review a 10-day waiting period for abortions or a 10-day waiting period on the publication of a racist speech, or a 10-minute 10, 10 delay of a traffic stop. Because apparently, abortion speech and the Fourth Amendment are three of its favored rights. Now, I can't imagine, <laughs> I can't imagine in this day and age, a any court besides the Supreme Court uh, deciding to uphold a law that would give a 10-day waiting period to the publication of a racist speech. But just just think about the, the situation that gun rights are in in this country right now. Now, it was all the way back in 2008 that the Supreme Court struck down the District of Columbia's outright ban on firearm ownership. And yet, to this day, we have similar bans or comparable bans in place in other cities and places, and still more cities, states, and towns have regulated gun ownership out of existence. And the High Court, the Supreme Court, has done nothing to redress this situation. And I think this is where Justice Thomas is coming from when he writes this rebuke of the court. You know, it's as he said, our Second Amendment rights are not to be considered a second-class right. 
In fact, the Second Amendment is part and parcel to the right to life. It's part of the thesis of one of the videos that I'm working on for this summer project that you that I've been teasing uh, for the last couple of weeks. The right to the right to wield power and to wield it indiscriminately is part and parcel to the right to self defense and the right to self. And it's not even the right to self-defense. It's the right to the preservation of life. And the right to preservation of life is part and parcel to the right to life in the first place. And the right to life being the most principal of our rights, I think it not inappropriate to say that the Second Amendment ought to be ought to be treated as just as important as a right, if not more important of a right, as the seeming right to choose an abortion is in this country. Let me know what you guys think, though. I'd love to hear your feedback. Leave something in the comments. If you enjoyed this video, leave a like, subscribe, and hit the bell for notifications so that you don't miss a single report. I'll be back tomorrow with a, another video. I hope to see you guys then. Until, that, until the time for that video comes, though, good night and God bless.